a warm hello to all my students of class 10 our story today is titled the making of a scientist but before we come to the lesson let us discuss as to what makes a good scientist or what are the qualities that one requires in order to be a good scientist I feel that a scientist definitely needs to be curious, patient and courageous. I use these two words patient and courageous because see a scientist will have to repeat experiments multiple number of times and there will be instances where he or she will face failures. So person definitely needs patience and needs to also be courageous enough to face all his or her failures. A scientist also needs to be open-minded and free of bias. He needs to be a critical thinker and a good problem solver. And of course, the most important factor is scientists have to have work ethics and maintain professional discipline. So our author Robert W. Peterson was an American newspaper writer who became a freelance author of magazine articles and books, especially on the topics of scouting and sports. He died on 11th February 2006 in Pennsylvania, United States of America. This story is about Richard E. Bright who grew up in Reading, Pennsylvania. Being the only child, he had no friends or company that he actually longed for. So, in order to pass his spare time, he began collecting things. In kindergarten, he collected butterflies, rocks, fossils and coins. He also loved gazing at stars all night. He was lucky to be gifted with not just curiosity and a sharp mind, but also a doting mother who loved him and encouraged his interest in learning. She took him on trips, bought him telescope, microscope, camera, mounting materials and many things more. She was his only home companion and loved doing things together especially after the death of his father when he was in grade 3. Because he had a sharp mind, he excelled in school. By the time he was in grade 2, he had already collected 25 species of butterflies. He would have probably given up on his collection hadn't his mother gifted him a book called the Travels of Monarch 10. The book was about monarch butterflies and how they migrate to Central America. This book somehow opened the world of science for him. At the end of the book, readers were invited to help study butterfly migration. They were asked to tag butterflies for research by Dr. Frederick A. Urquhart of the University of Toronto, Canada. Ebright's mother wrote to Dr. Urquhart and soon Ebright was attaching the light adhesive tags to the wings of the monarch. Anyone who found a tag monarch was asked to send the tag to Dr. Urquhart. Ebright then turned the basement of his home to raise butterflies through their life cycle 
from egg to caterpillar to pupa to adult butterfly. His interest in tagging butterflies faded when only two tagged butterflies were recaptured and that too only 75 miles away from his house. When he was in 7th grade and entered a county science fair and lost, he was disheartened. His entry was slides of frog tissues which he showed under a microscope. He realized that the winners had tried to do real experiments, not simply make nice clear displays. He had the competitive spirit already growing in him and decided that he would do a real experiment on a subject he was most comfortable with, that was insects. So he wrote to Dr. Urkuhart requesting for ideas and in came whole loads of suggestions for the same. These kept Ebright occupied all through high school and he won prize in county and international science fairs. In eighth grade, he tried to find the cause of a viral disease that kills almost all monarch capitals every few years. He thought this disease was carried by beetle, but didn't get any real result. He showed that he had tried the experiment and he won. In ninth grade, his science project was testing the theory that Viceroy butterflies copy monarch butterflies because Viceroy tastes good to birds unlike monarch and to save themselves they copy them. Ebright's project was to see whether birds would eat monarch. Starlings did eat only monarch. However, later research by others showed that Viceroy's probably copy monarch. This project was placed first in zoology division and third overall in the county science fair. In his second year in high school, Ebright began the research that led to the discovery of an unknown insect hormone. Indirectly, it led to his new theory on life of cells. The question he tried to answer was, what is the purpose of the 12 gold spots on a monarch pupa? Others said it was for ornamental purpose, so Ebright and another excellent science student worked and built a device that showed that those spots were used to produce a hormone necessary for the butterfly's full development. Their project won the first prize in the county fair and an entry into the International Science and Engineering Fair where he won the third prize for zoology. He also got a chance to work during the summer at the entomology lab of the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. As a high school junior, he continued his advanced experiments on monarch pupa and won first at the International Science Fair, which gave him another chance to work in the Army lab during summer. In his senior year, he went a step further. He grew cells from a monarch's wing in a culture and showed that the cells would divide and develop into normal butterfly wing scales only if they were fed the hormone of the gold spot. This project won him the first place for zoology at the International Fair. He spent his summer after graduation doing further work at Army Lab and at the lab of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. 
The following summer after his freshman year at Harvard University, he went back to the lab of the Department of Agriculture and did more work on the hormone from the gold spots. Using the lab's sophisticated instruments, he was able to identify the hormone's chemical structure. A year and a half later, during his junior year, he caught the idea for his new theory of cell life. It came while he was looking at the X-ray photos of chemical structure of a hormone. From here, he was able to answer how cells can read the blueprint of its DNA. DNA is a substance in the nucleus of a cell that controls heredity. It determines the form and function of the cell. The DNA is the blueprint for life. Ebright and his college roommate, James R. Wong, worked all night drawing pictures and constructing models of molecules to show how it could happen. Together, they later wrote the paper that explained the theory. Ebright passed out from Harvard with highest honors, second in his class of 1510. He became a graduate student researcher at Harvard Medical School, where he began doing experiments to test his theory. Ebright was an all-rounder, a champion debater, public speaker, good canoeist, and an expert photographer, particularly of nature and scientific exhibits. He was a straight A student in high school. He admired Mr. Weherer, his social science teacher whom he found perfect and who opened new ideas to him. Mr. Weherer too had a special liking for Richard, who according to him was hard-working and someone who was not interested to win for winning sake but someone who wanted to be the best in whatever he did. Hence, one of the ingredients in making of a scientist starts with a first-rate mind, that is, a brilliant mind, added with curiosity and the mix of the drive or the willpower. And with this, we come to the end of this lesson. I hope you all had a good time. Stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you.